afternoon and welcome to the SIP Hour, Power Hour Lunch. It's we're calling today Election Hangover. And so this is your post-election day conversation and analysis. Many of us went to bed um, not knowing the outcome of many of the elections, including um, who will be the next president of the United States. And we woke up this morning still uncertain. Um, but at the end of the day, a record number of Americans voted early and on election day. That is what democracy looks like. And so after a restless night of sleep, we all still are waiting on this, the results in several states. What we know so far is that um, Joe Biden has a slight lead with 227 electoral votes compared to Donald Trump's 213. Those numbers may have changed since I, since I've been on back-to-back -back Zooms, but that is what we know. However, this race is way too close to call. And wondering, are y'all wondering if there was any massive electoral shifts in some states? What we also know is that Trump won Florida, Texas, Georgia, not yet. I'm sorry, I know I'm going like Texas, Florida, <laughs> Texas, but I missed that important but in the script. But Georgia, North Carolina, Michigan, and Wisconsin is remains too close to call. Um, although we are going to he most likely hear some numbers today um, and may hear some additional numbers throughout the week, including being anticipating that we're going to hear Pennsylvania by Friday. And so today's conversation is um, what are we what do we need to do as voters? Black women have done our part, um, but there's still work to be done. I always say that election days don't begin and end on election day. In fact, they begin. Um, and you know, very proud of all of the work of the SIP hosts and our organizations. Um, if you have been following the SIP since March, you know the drill. We want to know where you are calling from. What are you hashtag exhausted? <laughs> How are you feeling today? And I will tell you that I went to bed exhausted, but I probably will be the SIP host that's saying that I woke up still hopeful um, about the possibilities. And um, I yesterday voted in person and um, voted where I know there was a variety of my my line had people that were voting for. Trump, people that were voting for Biden, but I wanted to start the chant, but I don't think my community would have appreciated it. Like, this is what democracy looks like. I wanted to go up and down and like, this is what democracy looks like. And I'm like, these women in my community, these people, they don't know that chant, but it was, a, it was older people, it was younger people. Um, there were people voting for the first time. Literally, like I said, I was like, I know we, you can tell we were having conversations and we were on the other side of who we were voting for. Um, but we stood quietly in that line, chatted here and there for, I stood for 40, 40 minutes. It was just 40 minutes. Um, but it was, that was hope for me. Yeah. Now, I have a bunch of things to unpack about my neighbors and the way they voted the country forward. Um, but Tracy, how are you feeling this morning or afternoon? You know, I'm one of these absentee ballots <laughs> that is waiting to be counted in Georgia in the sort of uh, outskirts of the Atlanta suburbs. And I'm like, Open, 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 you know, waiting. You are the black woman voter we're waiting for. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh, and, you know, I'm a native Detroiter, so I'm like waiting on them to count my mama's vote, just waiting for them to get to the good part, um, which is like the overwhelming number of voters that we saw across the country who voted in person. Uh, the hard part is that we, those of us who do this work day in and day out, knew that this was the scenario, right? That they're on election night, there were gonna be a lot of votes uh, that looked as if the election was swinging towards uh, Donald Trump um, being the clear winner and that there were millions of votes that needed to be counted and that it was going to take time across the country to get those votes. So I made this like little sign, count every vote, <laughs> like every day I'm like changing it to like give me hope. And like, we just have to keep calm and let folks count these votes y'all um, because 
whatever the outcome of the election is, like we have seen record voter turnout, which is exciting. I know we're going to get into a deeper conversation about the exit polls and who voted and who voted for whom and whatnot. But I'm just really proud of um, the activism um, that we saw in the run up to election day. I, you know, I said last night in our uh, election um, debrief that we're in a new wave of uh, activism in the civil rights movement um, of our time. And just really proud to be a part of that and making sure that we're doing um, what we can to save democracy because it feels like it's hanging on by a thread. And so I'm hopeful, being patient, hope other folks can just hang on a little longer, hang on a little longer. What about you, Judy? Well, I have a prop too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love so, it. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I am. I, I'm just gonna tell you, I'm tired. <laughs> I'm just like physically tired. I want to just sleep. I want to hibernate. Um, just because it's been a long cycle. It feels like it's like the longest election cycle ever. Um, and you know, being here in Florida for I don't know, it feels like. I don't know, it's more than 10 days now. Um, and then to see the results was, you know, Florida has broken my heart again, but that's all right, because there's a lot of good work happening here in Florida that I think will turn um, the state at some point. So I think that that's good. But, um, you know, listen, I we tell everybody to be patient, so we need to be patient, you know, like, don't give up. How you gonna tell everybody else, be patient. And you sitting there like, oh my God. No. Mm -mm. So last night, I didn't even hear those creatures. I went to sleep. You went to sleep? I didn't hear. And guess what? When y'all roll it on this show, it's going to be the first time that I heard what that fool said. So, um, Fatima, because <laughs> I didn't even watch it on replay. How about that? So... <laughs> I heard what he said. Somebody told me what he said. I read it on Twitter. But I, I just can't, I can't get into that because I know that these people who are the secretaries of states and the elections people are doing their job and that this is what, as you said, Glenda, democracy looks like. So um, Fatima, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I, so I think that you are right. I still am leaning into the fact that we had during a pandemic, under these conditions, people still turning out and finding a way to, to vote and their votes deserve to be counted. Okay. I mean, it would be unusual and extraordinary to decide we're not gonna count these votes. I have like these images in my mind of people like packing bags and gearing up and making plans to vote. They deserve their votes to be counted. And so, you know, telling all of us to be patient and including the media, which I have to say that I, although I was frustrated by their desire to have a minute by minute countdown last night, even though they knew that it wouldn't match the reality, it made me a little bit hopeful to see them reject out of hand and, and with great clarity the idea that Trump would just declare victory and that that meant anything in a democracy when votes were still being counted. So I, you know, I'm, I'm leaning into that. We can talk a little bit later about some of the bright spots because there are some bright spots even in states that have uh, had some weird results, but trying to stay calm and patient and, and Judith will tell me when I'm not. <laughs> This is going to be like, activate. Okay, we're activating. <laughs> and so last night we hosted, we gathered Black women virtually uh, for the, or at least the last of this season, hashtag Black women lead um, uh, watch parties. And it was great to actually be in community. I mean, I would have been watching glued to the TV. I did have the TV on in the background, but it was actually great to, to be in community with Black women who, you know, we had our own analysis our own colorful analysis. Um, and that gave me, like, it brightened up my spirit. Like, I wasn't, you know, like, at one point at like two o'clock, I was like, okay, let it go. I let it go and went to sleep and woke up this morning and started over. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, many of uh, our self wellness folk that have been on have said we can't be glued to the TV, we can't be glued to um, Twitter, that we need to pace ourselves, um, that this democracy is not um, a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah, um, I was sharing with folks last night that um, my team has put together 
a list of recommended things to do while we're passing the time and waiting for the bus to be counted. It's called uh, taketime2020.org. And we have curated a list of uh, Spotify playlists, recipes. If you want to watch a beaver eat cabbage to calm your nerves, I, I promise you it's actually really uh, calming. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take a yoga class, or just a bunch of recommendations. And we're hoping that you all can also share how you're doing self-care in this moment. Did you turn off the TV and go to bed? We want to see in the comments. I'll put the link uh, to the website in the comments and hopefully you can find something in there just to take a little time for yourself as we gear up uh, for the next phase of what will continue to be, uh, you know, a fight for the, the soul of this country. Let's get into a conversation about it. We're so excited to bring on um, a friend of the SIP, uh, Simone L. Ward, uh, who is the CEO uh, of SLW Strategies. You know, um, Simone is a force to be reckoned with and um, even in the midst of this craziness of 2020, just became a new mommy. <laughs> He literally had, I mean, it wasn't on election, but it's an election baby, y'all. Oh, it's our little election baby. It's like, there is hope. There is hope. How are you doing? I was like, what you drinking in that cup? What's your sip today? Call me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like a triple, quadruple espresso in here. <laughs> Trying to keep up. I wish it I wish it was spiked with something else, but uh, <laughs> after a little later in the day. Um, uh, yes, I am a, a new mom to a one week old, literally turned seven days on yet yeah, seven days mm -hmm. on election day so oh, congratulations thank you oh, thank you bad. i can't like getting snuggle and smell i know this is the kind of the time where you need that kind of snuggle and smell, and, smell that new, and you know how we like smell the new baby smell mm -hmm, the yeah. smell the new baby smell that that's enough endorphins. you've got it all like you said tracy there's uh the self-care that is my self-care right now just holding her and keeping close to her and uh wouldn't have it any other way but that's also why you know dark circles under the eyes and <laughs> in the back are, you know, 50% election night and 50% that, that, that new baby moment. But that's why I'm here, right? Yes. Because we got to make sure that she's, she's born into, or I should say she was born into a different world than we want her to grow up in, that's right? right. Yep. Um, and that's that's why I'm here today. That's right. Well, we're, you know, Simone uh, is a, a world-renowned um, political strategist. Like, I'm not joking. She actually is a world-renowned political strategist. Really glad that you could join us. You know, uh, those of us who work in politics have been doing a lot of work around what are the scenarios? You know, what's going to happen if this happens, if that happens? But for average everyday voters, like, they weren't anticipating this. If you didn't watch the, the nightly news or, you know, glued to Rachel Maddow, you didn't know like what's happening like they haven't counted these folks like what's going on so just wanting you know for those of us who have been um knee deep in this you know your initial reactions uh simone to you know how did you keep going last night like did you stay up and watch it like what was your plan and sort of watching the news did you go to bed late trusting that this was gonna all work out sounds like you might have been up feeding a baby but like <laughs> how did you manage uh, the evening you know, um, I will say that my my plan uh, was to watch the results until about 11 o'clock last night and then go to sleep so I could be up for that 3 a.m. feeding, um, but uh, wind up getting hooked to the news, uh, call it a professional hazard, um, and staying up till about 1.30, um, frankly, after fielding lots of calls from friends and family and colleagues and reporters who were you know, curious on my thoughts on places like Florida and Nevada and Pennsylvania that I've worked in before. Um, and honestly, just trying to reassure people, because I think the thing that I do know, having worked on five presidential campaigns, some of which are, are with the very stellar team that the Biden campaign has put together. Um, one, I have confidence in the vice president. Second, I have confidence in the plan and the preparation that they, they put together. And you see that and how they are handling this moment, right? Um, while I am excited, and I'm sure people were energized by the Rachel Maddows of the world and the, the liberal publications that said it was gonna be a, a, a landslide, a blowout, 300 you know, electoral votes for, for Joe Biden, um, I, I was more 
um, you know, I've seen that movie before. <laughs> right? And You're like, I watched that movie in Florida. Yeah, exactly. In 2016. Yeah, a few yeah. times. Florida uh, 2016 and Florida 2000. Yeah. Which I think right. is the other thing that I had to keep sort of sharing with people. Folks were like, well, this is very much feels like Florida 2016, Simone. You know, we lost that and people were expecting us to win. I, I think it was an overestimation for people to think we were going to win Florida last night. Or Texas, for that matter. Exactly. So that's the first thing. So I was not surprised that it that it spanned the way that it did. The second thing I would say is, to me, this year feels a lot more like a combination of 2000 and 2008. And I'll tell you why. 2008, because of the record turnout, right? Mm -hmm. If you all remember right. that wonderful feeling that uh, we had when um, President Obama was elected in his historic candidacy. Um, and the turnout was was historic in that moment, but as we have exceeded that, you know, uh, and then some this year. But in 2000, um, for those of you that are of the same age bracket that I am or older, um, I won't put y'all on blast, but um, I know- We, we, we are the auntie brigade. You're, you're right. Right. Auntie brigade. <laughs> I, was, I was one brigade. of the, I was one of the lawyers in the, in the case right. in Florida. So that's, that's like, right. I was around when election protection first started. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Um, I was the founder. I was the founder. Right. Love it. <laughs> Love it. So I remember counting ballots in Florida, you know, chads, hanging chads. And remember that that election was called within 500 votes, right? Mm -hmm. It was 537 to be exact. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> um, it was the epitome of every vote counts, right. right? And so we find ourselves here again. And so I, one, I am proud of the American people, as you said, Tracy, for stepping up and mm -hmm. voting in a pandemic with, you know, just everything on the line. I think that shows mm -hmm. that democracy really does work. I may not agree with every vote that was cast. Um, but I think that's okay, right? That's part of what makes America live into the promise that we're in. So I, I did turn off the TV at about one so I could get a couple hours of sleep uh, before the three o'clock feeding. Um, I would encourage other people to turn the channel. That's right. <laughs> like, that's don't right. make yourself crazy. Um, I expected it to be take a couple of days. The campaigns expected it to take a couple of days. And I think as long as we keep remembering that the ballots that are out are in, um, precincts and counties that are really reflective of, I think, progressive values and democratic votes that we're on the right track. And that's not just a talking point. Um, it's not a talking point. You know, uh, Joe Biden came out. He was the first to come out last night uh, and said, who knew, Georgia? I don't, let's count these votes. It's a little better than I thought. Let's, let's, let's play the clip. Good evening. Your patience is commendable. We knew this was going to go long. Okay, so we're in the, we're in the sound. We we're going to go into maybe tomorrow morning, maybe even longer. But look, we feel good about where we are. We really do. I'm here to tell you tonight, we believe we're on track to win this election. We knew because of the unprecedented early vote and the mail-in vote, that it's going to take a while. We're going to have to be patient until we, uh, the hard work of tallying the votes is finished. And it ain't over till every vote is counted, every ballot is counted. So as you can see, he was exuding confidence. I said, oh, well, that's interesting. I mean, he, he was not sluggish at all. He was upbeat. And I think that, um, you know, he was very intentional about, you know, this narrative around making sure that the votes are counted. Um, I, you know, this is, we've been talking about this as election season, sort of early voting and absentee ballot is new for some states, not necessarily new for other states who had those um, policies in place. But do you believe that the speech that Biden la made last night, and I'll ask this of, you know, all of the um, the host as well, like the sort of strategy that Biden had last night, was his speech a part of a broader strategy to Simone's earlier point? Do you think that they, this has been a part of their game plan as well? They, they, they've seen these numbers for the last couple of weeks. Do, do you think this was intentional, his speech was? I mean, I think everything we are seeing right now is sort of, 
So, you know, to your earlier point, the general public wasn't expecting this. So this feels uncomfortable and, and we all want certainty, but the campaigns were very, very ready. And so including they were ready for Trump to declare victory. So I, I actually think um, the way in which he modeled an ability to express confidence and while also saying, and that's why we have to count all the votes, stood as such a sharp contrast to uh, to how Trump handled it. For sure. Um, to, to, to that point, I think we should also share, I, to, like you, Judy, at the after uh, about one o'clock, I was like, ooh, child, I'm going to bed. Like, he really going to speak tonight? Oh, well, I'm... <laughs> Catch that in the morning. <laughs> but, you know, he reportedly said that he would declare victory as early, you know, as a, you know, that was his early strategy before the election. And he did exactly uh, what he said he was going to do. Let's, let's go to that clip as well. And all of a sudden, everything just stopped. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? It's, it's a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment. And we will win this. And we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. So I just want to thank you. Mm. 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 That's a, <laughs> it's mm. a very sad moment when people got to vote absentee ba ballot because right. it's a global pandemic that could have been controlled. That's that's what I mean. What's what's sad is he's sad. <laughs> um, what is sad is that we have this is unprecedented for a president to be calling our democracy uh, and our election system a fraud is unprecedented and and it also is another one of those opportunities where he comes out and says things and acts and has either has not a clue or doesn't care like you ain't just walking up into the supreme court and acting like this is my bush v gore moment and here it is supreme court a vote for me like he, like he the thing that the supreme court though he thinks right no he did pick the supreme court but he also like there have been times when he has gone to the Supreme Court and those conservative judges have said, don't come in here with, no here garbage, with, that. with your garbage. And so I'm not saying that he couldn't wind up there and win, but like his whole theory of the case is ridiculous because he just starts off with, I'm just going to go to the Supreme Court. And I mean, and so I think, and, he, and he's definitely planting the seeds of dissent. He's feeding his base so that if he loses, that he will have been right the whole time about what a fraud this, this country is. But the, and that's what's important here, right? Because he's saying that quiet part out loud. And so if a case is before the Supreme Court, I mean, one of the reasons he's had problems there before is because he says what he is really trying to do. He says that quiet part out loud. So. I, you know, I, I also think it is sad to see a president engaging in disinformation mm -hmm. and trying to undermine our democracy, you know, and so if we are able to reject that as an ethos, reject that as an approach and demonstrate that it doesn't work, that will be good for our democracy. Right. And if you check his Twitter account today, Twitter is like, uh, no, we're not. We're not going to let that be retweeted. There's several of his tweets where they have flagged it for content for right. misinformation. The freaking president of the United States. It's, yeah, it's, it's 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 again. We keep the word unprecedented. It's like <laughs> that that should be the word for 2020 because everything about this year 
is, and for folks who don't know, who don't like work in this world, one of the things that um, some of the social media uh, outlets did, like Facebook and Twitter, was created what we call a dark week, where it, between uh, it was like the beginning of last week, Monday, and through this week, there was um, no political advertising. Uh, that uh, any organization or campaign could put up that hadn't already been running. So one of the things uh, that is happening now is like you're not going to see a bunch of ads floating around talking about how the election is stolen. So that was one safeguard that they put in place to help quell some of the disinformation. The problem is you got the president <laughs> pushing the disinformation. He's got the largest platform so they can shut him down, but they're, that's still going to get covered by the media. And I'm really curious to see how the media plays their hand in this moment about giving him airtime and space to push um, some of this rhetoric that is just damaging, particularly because there are folks who truly do believe this. Before we uh, end this segment, I'm curious about who do you all believe are the winners um, of the election, just overall? And although there were some bright spots, we'll get into some of that uh, later in the show, but who do you believe the winners are? <laughs> I mean, I can tell you. Really, I'm, people? <laughs> no one. Yeah, I think the American people are are winners. I think poll poll workers and poll watchers are the winners. Frankly, the winners right now. Yeah, uh, this, that job is no joke, and you you are doing it uh, in real time. Uh, you know, if you watch the news this morning, they announced the name of the 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 uh, poll worker who was taking the Wisconsin ballots by police escort to the Secretary of State's oh. office. Full name, first, middle, and last, right? Oh, no. <laughs> um, it's it's no joke, right? And these people are 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 remarkable because they have come out in a pandemic and and are doing their 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 public service to help a, a democracy. So for me, they are they are the winners. Um, and I think, frankly, just you know the protesters, you know, we, it's, it's, they have changed the course of this election and the dialogue that we are, that we are talking about, that the campaigns that the candidates are talking about. Um, and to me, that makes them winners. And I think we're seeing that um, across the board um, and look forward to continuing that, that, that conversation with those, those leaders as well. Yeah, and I'll stay on brand, Black women voters. <laughs> we did what mm -hmm. we said we were going to do. Yeah, we and do. Also, we always do. I do think there's a longer conversation as we see the exit polls come out, which, you know, for folks who, again, are not data nerds, like you see this snapshot, but it doesn't necessarily necessarily tell the full story of, you know, Latinos, which is a not a monolith. And we're going to talk more about that or AAPI voters or black voters. For that matter, we've had conversations about the differences of how black women and black men show up. And so I'm actually really excited about getting our hands around the nuances of yeah. that. You know, I was saying earlier that um, you know, Jamie Harrison in South Carolina, there was a lot of excitement about his race. He raised more money than anybody ever, ever. and he still lost that race. And so this point about activism, like th the other side of that coin is that hashtag racism. <laughs> mm -hmm. Racism mm -hmm. was a winner uh, mm -hmm. last night uh, in many ways. And like, we are gonna have to deal yeah. with that, um, mm -hmm. whether, Biden wins or Trump wins. We're that like you can't put this genie back in the bottle, and so it's going to be really interesting to see how the country moves forward, knowing that folks are really, really divided. Well, and while we have Simone here, I got to hear your thoughts on Miami Dade, and you know, yeah, uh, it's a great, it's a great point, and interestingly, it sort of builds on what Tracy just said about racism. <laughs> I think that sometimes in this country, we forget that racism is just is not just the majority to the minority voters, but also systemic racism impacts cultures within itself. Um, and I think what you saw in, um, in Miami-Dade is, is, is a, a few things. One, I think that there is a very- Who did she ask that to? A, a very real impact of, um, of systemic racism and uh, combined with uh, that combined with the with the um, disinformation um, campaign being successful in South Florida, right? Mm -hmm. You you take a group of of voters 
primarily Caribbean and Cuban Americans, and tell them that Joe Biden and Democrats are socialist. And these are in individuals who have fleed countries where socialism has not uh, fared well for them and their families. They are not gonna support that candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and you saw that, I mean, they, yeah. those numbers, 10 times the difference between 2016 and, and 2020. So Hillary and Biden. Um, I also think that there is, you know, a real challenge that we have within the Latino community um, that is also divided, right? And we should not assume that there's a monolith there just because they are people of color. Um, and so you see that, and I think that's an impact of systemic racism and frankly, colorism, um, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And then third, I think there's some very religious um, and um, voters who voted around the economy that was best for them. And they, they, they believe the hype that Donald Trump has produced. Um, and so I think those things will continue to be the case in a place like South Florida. And then lastly, it's just a big state, right? It's always gonna be very expensive. You can't wait until September to try to invest and communicate in a state like Florida. And frankly, Republicans have done very well for the last five to six cycles, investing year round um, in that place. Um, and you see the results. Yeah, it was interesting last night, Andrew Gillum, um, former uh, gubernatorial candidate for Florida, was doing a, a similar uh, commentary show with Angela Rye last night. And one of the questions that someone asked him was like, you know, what's going on in Florida? He was like, well, I mean, listen, nobody reached out to talk to me. I was the only candidate who within the last 20 years got this close um, to winning uh, the governorship there. And like, no one asked us how we did that, right? So to your point about investment, they were saying that Biden didn't spend a lot of time in Florida. He sent Obama in like, you go see if you can deal with this. I'm going to focus on the Midwest, <laughs> but you go get them. And that for me, again, is this conversation about what do investments in communities look like year round? What are the conversations that we need to be having with men of color around why they feel like their economic interest is better suited um, by having other people, you know, pushing policies that they believe is going to help um, their, their, their bottom line. So we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, would, I just wanted to add on the Miami-Dade piece. I, I mean, I want to double click on the Latino vote, right? Because we also, there's a growing Venezuelan population in South Florida, Colombian population, and people come to the United States with histories, right? That they then come and say, okay, well, how is this thing here playing out? And I, you know, I saw lots of signs around the socialism piece. Um, the commercials that are um, anti-Black commercials that the, because remember there was a mayoral race at the same time. And the mayoral race was, there were some really horrible ads about, um, that was directed at like the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And being scared about that. Um, and then I also think like the, when we talk about investments, this like, you know, I saw it again, like we always see is this last minute investment in groups on the ground so that people are getting money and being like, well, what can I do with this now in this last minute? And now that you have a blackout on advertising, really, what can I do? Because I used to just be able to throw it into <laughs> radio, throw, you know, just do media stuff. And now I can't do that. And so I think there's and and there's a cluster of groups and an infrastructure in um, in Miami-Dade, but like, what about Broward? What about West Palm Beach? There are a lot of other places in Florida that we can tap into for progressive voters that haven't been invested in. I think that the groups down here are starting to expand, but remember they haven't had that ongoing investment in their infrastructure to be able um, to do that. So, um, so I wanna pivot a little bit to the surprises. Any surprises? Let's talk about, first let's talk about surprises on motivating factors of voters. Anything that people think, you know, we know that there were people that we said were gonna be motivated by COVID. There are people who are gonna be motivated by policing. And then I guess on the other side, the law and order people who were motivated. Um, anything that about motivation surprised you? I, w I wouldn't call it a, um, a surprise, um, but it is an outlier because of 2020 and the global pandemic and people voting by mail. And so at the end of the day, what I call what will be the November surprise uh, is when you open up Tracy's ballot that overwhelmingly Black women voted early 
and those are the <laughs> those are the envelopes that are going to open that m might um, or I would say hopefully decide this election and and so um, I think that that will be you know people are seeing the numbers come in and are, they're concerned but as you know there's a, a lot of reporting and conversations coming out of the campaigns about uh, the ballots that remain open, unopen, where they coming from, and that it is a fact that we had a record number of Black women that voted early and by mail. I'm so excited that this is going to come down to the Tracy vote. The Tracy I know vote. how to pick a swing state. I know how to pick one. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Fatima, and Simone. So one of the things that I uh, it shouldn't be a surprise, but I think it just revealed how differently people in this country are experiencing not only this pandemic, but the economic consequences that, that tie to it. And so you have a lot of folks whose jobs have remained, who are working from home and are inconvenienced in, in one way, but frankly, maybe they see themselves saving money. And you have 12% of Black women unemployed. And so you're experiencing this pandemic really differently. And I think when folks said this economy is good, like I've seen polling around people saying this economy is good, I, I, it just highlights that um, in this very, very moment, we're living in very different experiences and this economy is good is not that good. And so it also is a reminder of how we tell that story of what it is people are experiencing. Yeah, it's good if you got stocks. <laughs> <You know? laughs> not good if you're working three minimum wage jobs. Like, right. and I'm just like, why can't we tell that story? Because that's the story of millions and millions of Americans. Um, I, I'm really excited about Arizona. Listen, that Arizona, they ain't see yeah. that coming. That 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 that's 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 a monkey wrench. <laughs> what about what about down ballot? I think I mean Arizona is definitely, especially because let's let's talk about it, like in a state where they had Joe Arpaio, who was the sheriff for a very long time, but they were able to unseat him. Um, you know, so what about down ballot? We there were you know let's remember there's Senate races. So, yeah, so there was a record number of black women running for the house. Um, and so today, you know, I thought today was going to be a different day for particularly higher heights endorsed candidates. Right. Um, but proud of the races that these first time candidates ran. Right during a global pandemic. First of all, as a first time Simone knows this as a first time candidate, you're just trying to navigate the plan. They didn't have to pivot and, and decide how am I going to reach voters during a global pandemic. And so every single one of um, you know, the black women across this country that stepped off the sidelines and, and felt that they had leadership um, to provide into this democracy, we say thank you. Um, but there are some surprises. Um, you know, everybody, people are sticking to the messaging plan. So many races, although you know, I'm personally calling it, people are saying until every vote counts. So it it is projected that we're sending back the freshman five, the five black women that we elected in 2018, Lucy McBath, um, Lauren Under, um, Lucy McBath, Ayanna Presley, Johanna Hayes, I'm Stra Ilhan Omar and Lucy uh, and Lauren Underwood that I'm calling, she ain't calling it, but Lauren Underwood. <laughs> uh, but a little surprise is Marilyn Strickland, Washington State, a race nobody was talking about. Uh, one of our endorsed candidates, she just was projected by um, by the, the, the Associated Press as being the winner. Washington, y'all, Washington State. So people are asking where Adrian is. So since I'm shouting out Adrian Shropshire's home state, Adrian is out doing the work of black people <laughs> uh, with Black Pack. She'll be back on Sunday. Um, but we will certainly let her know that y'all are like, where's Adrian? We want to hear Adrian's voice. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, again, we joke around like black people in Washington state. Uh, and so we're sending Marilyn Strickland, who was the former mayor of Tacoma um, to uh, Washington. So that to me is a bright spot. And Candace Venezuela is fighting to every single vote counts in a very um, close election. When I talk about she's calling around and canvassing if her family voted. That's how close this is. And so we, you know, we are poised to send the first Afro-Latina 
to Congress, uh, and more importantly, a mom of a, um, two very small children. She's been breastfeeding, um, Zooming, and talking to candidates. I'm talking to voters during the cycle. And Simone's like, yeah, that's um, running for office. And so that's my bright spot. Um, and we are certainly ready when these women who, um, you, know, you know, it wasn't their night last night, ready for whatever political leadership role they're ready to do and we're, you know, we're ready. I'm already like, so what's next? They're like, can we get a nap? Well, I mean, one of the th interesting things about Georgia is that the elections are not over. Um, we've still got nine more weeks of elections. So there's a special election that happens for District 5, which is a district uh, that John Lewis uh, served in. Uh, there's a 30 day uh, the remainder of his term for this congressional year. And then uh, Nakima Williams, uh, who ran uh, to fill the term for uh, the new Congress, uh, who was projected um, to, to win that race, and uh, will be going uh, in, in January. But there's a race uh, for just District 5 that will happen uh, in the next uh, month. And then the runoffs which it looks as if there will be two for the Senate. And so as the Senate sort of hangs in the balance and we don't quite know like what's gonna happen, there are still two Senate races that will that are yet to be determined here in Georgia that um, the runoff for those won't happen until January. And what's really interesting about uh, these runoffs is like Georgia has had a bunch of runoffs in the last decade, but this will be the first time that they've had a black man <laughs> or a black person, I should say, but definitely a black man, um, Reverend Warnock, uh, who is the uh, preacher at Ebenezer Baptist Church uh, and Martin Luther King Jr.'s um, uh, home church, uh, that he will be on the ballot. And so people are excited about the potential of him uh, energizing folks to turn out in January. Usually in these runoff, folks are like, I voted in November, I'm tired, I ain't got no time to be all these voting. But we're really excited to see what type of turnout um, will happen and the work that will be done in the next nine weeks to make sure that the democracy continues to work because these two Senate races are going, I think are gonna be like the telltale of what happens with the Senate going um, into the new year. So that, that, that definitely um, is a, a bright spot and a, and, a, and a surprise for sure. So Simone, what about you? Uh, surprises and also I want you to tell us what disappointments. Let's yeah, go, for sure. There too. Well, Judy, I, I think you you sort of uh, hit the nail on, on the thing I want to discuss is the down ballots. Um, you know, we uh, progressives, Democrats uh, pushed Republicans and the chambers to spend money and resources all over this country. And I think you work in 2018. I think you will continue to see the results as every vote is, is counted. Um, um, and so, you know, we may not have won Texas last night, but, but the fact that it was even competitive is progress. The fact that, uh, you know, we made them spend money in places like Ohio, in places like Wisconsin, and not just at the top of the ticket, but down ballot. I think that shows real progress and frankly, um, will create a path for more black women to Glenda's point, let me put on my higher hat sport hat for a minute, um, to, to, to have more places to run. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and I think that there's like these, these moments of highlights uh, in a sea of, of losses, including the, speaking of Miami Dade, the Democratic mayors um, that was elected their first female. Um, um, in the in the in the area, so I think that there's lots of opportunities in terms of disappointments. Look, I think there's two big ones. One is um, I think Democrats expected to win more U.S. Senate races um, uh, with the turnout the way that it was um, last night. They had hoped to flip seats in places like Iowa, uh, in places like um, Maine, um, and uh, even more competitive in places like Montana. Right, um, but as you can see, uh, we're unable to do that. Um, although I do know that in Maine, there they have a rank choice voting system, so it's technically not over. But Sarah Gideon has called and conceded um, to Susan Collins. Um, 
And as the former DSCC political director, like we, we should be paying attention. If you think about what happened last week with the Supreme Court vote, it, all, all, all the more reason that not only does the presidency matter, but the US Senate is important. Um, so we've got some work to do there. And I think that's a disappointment. And specifically on that note, and Tracy mentioned this earlier, you know, I really, really wanted to see Jamie Harrison pull it out, right? Um, and I think that was disappointing for a lot of people. But I also was just amazed at the campaign he ran, um, the amount of resources and support that he got, not just from in-state, but all over the country, and frankly did it with low dollar contributions. So to me, uh, that speaks to the ability, again, of democracy in action. People are showcasing their support, uh, not only with their vote, but with their resources as well. And that's, that's a lot to ask in the economy that we're in. <clears throat> Well, I have to say that um, it is hard for me in that race, not only because of Jamie, but because that means South Carolina is sending Lindsey Graham back. Oh, girl. <laughs> and I said, can you imagine the WhatsApp uh, text thread that Susan Collins and Lindsey Graham got going right now? <laughs> <laughs> Woo, girl. <laughs> like, I, knew, just, I mean, <laughs> it, uh. It is rough, it is rough uh, to see rewards for um, how they have mangled the Supreme Court. So I will leave it. I will leave it there. But you know, we all need to dig in to a little bit more detail on what this means. And but now we're in a situation. So the votes, people have voted. And after people vote, those votes are counted. And I feel like I just need to keep saying that, like people mm -hmm. voted, and that happened, and yesterday was the last day. And then those votes are counted. Mm -hmm. And so now, as this- They're counts, not still voting, by the way. They're not still voting. are not still voting. That's- They voted. And one point. <laughs> for counting those votes. And so, um, so the big question is, how long is it going to take <laughs> to count these votes? I mean, part part of what I think people don't understand is that some of this, this uh, later counting of mail-in votes, that was sort of on purpose, right? That was states making decisions. And I don't know, Judy, if you can explain that, because I think people are like, well, what is it about Pennsylvania that takes so long to count? Well, um, it's funny because the Pennsylvania legislature, actually the Secretary of State, who's a former advancement project attorney, by the way, um, Kathy Bookfar, um, wanted, don't tell anybody, um, actually wanted to start the count earlier because like a state like Florida by law, they do the mail-in count as they come. Yeah, and missing so, it, they wanted yeah, to do it earlier. So they're doing, right, and that's just a way to streamline it, give you a result sooner. Right. The Pennsylvania legislature, Republican-led legislature, said when they wanted the actual secretary of state, the governor, et cetera, wanted to do this change so that they could start earlier, said no. That's right. So now your boy is upset talking about you, you know, this is wrong. They're still voting. No, no, no. But this was a part of their strategy. They did the same thing in Michigan. They, want, they, they pushed for the entire year to get the legislature to change this law. And they didn't because they know they needed this to happen. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. And so so and remember, so they have three days, so they have this other period of time by state law, right, not by the governor, where you can, you have to have it postmarked on third, and then you get three days for the mail to get it in. So that's the other thing that's happening is that technically they really should not have their vote until like Friday. All right, so they'll be counting and possibly through Friday. And in the meantime, um, as we already talked about, Trump has said, I'm on my way to the Supreme Court. <laughs> uh, so, but there may be litigation. It, you know, if there is litigation, what are the types of legal issues do you think are going to come? What's the, one is re add? recount. Mm -hmm. That's my, sorry. sorry uh, can I just add, I mean, we, we will be waiting for Pennsylvania possibly till Friday, but they just called Wisconsin for Joe Biden. Um, and so I wanna be clear about that. It is likely that they will call Michigan today, if not yeah. first thing tomorrow and the same thing with Nevada. So while 
um, I just want as as people that are not as into the details as I am, <laughs> or or even if I shouldn't be, right? Um, just clarifying that I think the next three days we'll see shifts each day, um, and. I do think that there is litigation, litigation to come, including the fact that in, in the states that we just named, you can request a recount um, if you are the loser and um, President Trump has already requested one for Wisconsin. So again, I think the campaigns are prepared for that. I think this is a part of their strategy. Um, and um, I, I think we will see that. I thought he wanted them to stop counting. <laughs> no, he wanted them to stop voting. He didn't That's say count. Right. He said stop voting. But no, also, if, you, if, you, if your vote didn't get counted by the time the clock ran out, it don't count. Like that's right. Essentially right. What it and so here's the thing: clear, is he Wisconsin, wants them to count in Arizona. He wanted them right. to keep counting in Arizona. Right. He's, right. he's very not in any other state. and definitely not in, <laughs> not in Michigan because Michigan that's Detroit. He don't want them Detroit right. votes coming in, and he don't want them Georgia, Fulton County, and all that coming in. But here's the thing: so Wisconsin, if they do the he's gonna file for recount and that we should know, like that's gonna take time too. It's probably about another 20 days before they actually have to certify that thing. So um, so that's gonna take time. And then we'll see, There's this is the other thing is there's still this post office litigation going on that was not their, their litigation. This was brought by outside parties. Um, the NACB Legal Defense Fund is in that case. Um, and that case was where the judge had required a sweep of the polling of the of the post offices, not all post offices across the country, but there were certain post offices. And um, he, they have, they were supposed to do an all clear by like three o'clock yesterday. And then postal service officers were like, "No, we didn't do that. We, we nope." So, so there's still that process going on um, in front of Judge Sullivan, black judge in D.C. Yes, yes, um, where that may, you know there may be something that comes out of that, but we'll, we'll see. So one of the things um, about these states that we are still waiting on or where I guess there may be a recount um, is that they are also in these same states in Michigan, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, states where we have seen um, not only meaningful activism from, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter, Movement for Black Lives, but we have also seen radical um, white militia groups emerge, um, including ones that uh, were trying to kidnap the governor. So, right. I, you know, how should we think about safety in this period where we are gonna be waiting? What are things that people need to be thinking about and planning for? You know, it's funny, I, you know, a bunch of friends who are in Detroit now who volunteer to be counters. They're, they're out here counting votes. Mm -hmm. And I got a text message um, from one who said that um, they are getting, um, there are team leads, people who are mo you know, helping to moderate their, their engagement. It says, um, it's getting bad here. Our team leads are talking to us about physical safety and intimidation. And so there are people, like we're not hearing a lot about it on the me in the media, but now as these states are getting closer and we know like where the hot spots are, like, you know, Simone mentioned the person in Wisconsin who was the person who was like taking the ballot, but like it's getting hot out in these streets. We didn't see it last night, but I think over the next couple of days, we're going to start to see it emerge um, that the counter protesters or the people who are, self-professed poll watchers or counters at this moment, that we're gonna see more of that energy um, over the course of the day and into to tomorrow. So first, the safety of the people who are volunteering to make sure that the votes are actually counted, like making sure that we're being intentional about having the support that they need to, to, to do this civic duty um, in this moment. I'm very, very concerned um, about that, particularly in these, these states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, where, you know, these militias have been very vocal and open. Um, and the, and, the, the, and the National Guard has been in, has been activated by um, some of, some of the governors to be ready. They're not out and mobilized yet, but they are kind of on call. 
Uh, and so they are supposed to be um, there to any post-election violence, they are supposed to be on tap for, um, you know, and we're gonna see, we're definitely gonna see protests and actions and, you know, regardless of how this plays out, I know that there's a big national mobilization on Saturday, um, which is really a mobilization around count every, every vote. Um, and so the question is with this current president, um, when people mobilize around saving our democracy and counting every vote, will he enter in with some level of repression? So that's, <laughs> that is worrisome. What's yeah. not worrisome is that baby. Oh, <laughs> the election oh, oh. Look at Molly. Can you say hi to the people? Oh, such a newborn. <laughs> we got future voters of America here. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree I agree with what Judy said about and Tracy about the unrest that might be coming I think that the challenge and I think Fatima you were headed this way but we're thinking similar thoughts is that the president of the United States is is inciting it right yeah. he is stand, <laughs> stand by and stand back right this is this is a direct quote from our president on the debate stage let alone what he has said in the last 24 hours so I think we really have to be conscious of that um, and you see that preparation happening with boarding up places around the White House and, you know, sort of some of the protests that started and broke out in places like LA last night in North Carolina. Um, so it's already beginning. And my concern is, you know, depending on how the results go, either way, right. that there's going to be that same sort of show of um, some violence and aggression. And, uh, you know, I just think people need to take care of themselves, stay home, be safe, be smart. Um, you know, it, none of this is worth our, your life. That's right. And yeah. FYI, I've already gotten my Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, let me go fill up the tank with some gas and order some uh, costumes. I mean, just like toilet paper, <laughs> turkeys might be the thing that people hoard. So. Well, I think calm, calm is in order. Um, but I don't know. I may be old fashioned. <laughs> I just, I really believe that one person can't tank down our democracy yeah. and these votes will be counted and our institutions will endure and we will have a huge road ahead of us, but uh, calm patience. I think there's calm and patience, but I do believe that some of the norms that have governed us have eroded and they are counting on more erosion. And so there is calm and then there's turn up, right? To ensure that we are letting them know like, no, we're like, this is, it's not going down that way. Um, so I am hopeful uh, that we will see that over there. But I trust and believe this thing gets called today. Like this fight is not over. This is, this is gonna be it's going to be a minute um, and it's going to hit these state legislatures. And so folks have got to gear up and be ready um, for the fight. And that's going to require everyday citizens to be in conversation with their elected officials about where you stand on this and wanting to make sure that, that, that the vote stands, the, both the popular vote <laughs> and these votes that have been counted, recount, count them again, let's count them again. But you will go through the process. And I think that the more that we can push that we will not stand for more erosion, the better. So keep calm and turn up. <laughs> you there? I'm like, let's go get some shirts. <laughs> well, I do know one thing that I just, just quickly, I want to know what people are excited that you're not going to have to deal with anymore. Uh, no more text messages, no more phone calls. <laughs> I'm like, I already voted. Stop texting me. Well, you know, depending on what state you're going to not have. Oh, that's time. right. No, that's right. I'm here in Georgia. Yeah, I got nine Georgia, more. Georgia, you're going to be getting it. We want to know if, you know, it doesn't your signature. Like, so it's, for some, it's not over. Um, what I'm not going to miss, um, because it's still going to happen, is hanging out with the sick women. Um, oh. Because we will be back on Sunday for Sunday brunch for a longer um, guess what are we talking about on Sunday? Yeah. This election. <laughs> um, but we have some really great treats in November um, because it is the season. We're starting to go into holiday season. So meet us back for Sunday brunch um, uh, at two o'clock Eastern Standard Time. 
with your ship host, because apparently I didn't do this in the beginning, which is why they were like, where is Adrian? <laughs> Judith Brown Diane is from the Advancement Project National Office Action Fund. Fatima Gosgraves from the National Women's Law Center Action Fund. Uh, Tracy, I'm done. Tracy Sturdivant <laughs> from the League Action. Adrian Shropshire from Black Pack will be back on Sunday. And I'm Glenda Carr from Higher Heights. And thank you so much, Simone Ward, for joining us. And more importantly, bringing us our election baby. Um, that <laughs> is what democracy looks like. Have a good day. Bye, sweetie. Bye. Be well.